Um, so last time uh, we focused on uh, congenital heart disease, but um, you know, uh, heart disease in pregnancy is not just limited to congenital heart disease. We also see um, acquired heart uh, disease frequently. Um, and if you look, uh, maternal mortality is, is a problem in the United States, and uh, unlike other countries in Europe and, and uh, with uh, advanced healthcare systems, uh, maternal mortality in the United States has increased um, significantly over the past um, 25 years or so. Each year is a steady increase. Um, when we look at um, the, the causes, um, you can see uh, on, on this slide here um, on the left, you can see that uh, more traditional causes of maternal mortality, hypertension, uh, thromboembolic disease, hemorrhage, infection, the, the, the risks um, or the rates of those uh, conditions have decreased, but uh, what's increased is um, cardiac disease, both cardiomyopathy and other cardiovascular conditions. In fact, um, of, of all pregnancy-related uh, deaths, uh, roughly a third are due to cardiovascular conditions. Um, so that's a, and that uh, rate and increase is, is growing. Now, there's a lot of reasons for that, um, which I don't have um, the time uh, here. A lot of it has to do with an aging um, obstetrical population with more uh, comorbidities. Um, but when we think about um, cardiovascular emergencies that occur during pregnancy in the mother, um, you know, thromboembolic disease obviously um, is, is, a, is a big topic. Um, but the two that I'm going to focus on in the time that we have are myocardial infarction and aortic dissection. Um, I do have another talk on heart failure later, and we'll address peripartum cardiomyopathy. Um, but again, as I, as I mentioned, um, uh, the obstetrical pop population is changing in, in, as a whole. Um, we're having fewer babies uh, in, in the United States. Um, the birth rate is declining. However, the age group where it's increasing are women over 35 and especially women over 40. So with that, we're seeing higher um, you know, comorbidities, hypertension, diabetes, and of course we have the obesity epidemic. So all these are significant risk factors for um, cardiovascular disease, and so we are seeing an increase in myocardial infarction um, during pregnancy. Uh, in fact, and pregnancy as appears to predispose to to this, because um, you see there's a threefold increase in myocardial infarction during pregnancy and the postpartum period compared to women who are non-pregnant of a similar age, and it has a higher mortality during pregnancy than in a non-pregnant state. And a lot of this has to do with the uh, the increased incidence has to do with the physiology of pregnancy, uh, which we touched on earlier. Um, but there's increased demand for oxygen uh, in the pregnancy and uh, a decrease in the delivery based on anemia and a decrease in the diastolic blood pressure. So uh, for patients who have some underlying cardiac disease, this may be enough to push them over the top. Uh, diagnosis of myocardial infarction is very similar uh, to a non-pregnant state, the EKG and car cardiac enzymes. Now, what's different is the underlying pathophysiology that um, differs significantly from myocardial infarction in the in the general population, up to 40% of myocardial infarction are not are due to um, spontaneous coronary artery dissection or SCAD, uh, which is quite different in the general population. And atherosclerosis, which is the leading cause in the general population, is actually the second leading cause in pregnancy. There's also a significant uh, amount, n a number of cases due to just clot formation, which again is due to the hypercoagulable state associated with pregnancy. And again, this is quite different um, than in a non-pregnant state. Um, treatment of myocardial infarction in pregnancy is very similar, uh, again, to a non-pregnant state with medical management initially. Uh, and really, we, if that can be enough, then that's great. But percutaneous coronary intervention is uh, preferred, especially with ST cell segment elevation. Um, there can be shielding. Uh, and also a radial or brachial approach to minimize uh, radiation exposure uh, to the fetus along with decreasing fluoroscopy time. Um, thrombolysis is, is somewhat controversial in pregnancy because there, there can be uh, significant risks for, with, to the mom with that. Um, 
and so its use is much more limited. And also, with uh, coronary artery dissection being a, a, one of the leading causes, um, thrombolysis in that situation uh, can actually propagate uh, the, the, the underlying issue and can lead to worse outcomes. Um, so again, what is a uh, spontaneous coronary artery uh, dissection is that, again, um, this comprises about 40% of uh, pregnancy-related uh, myocardial infarction. Uh, risk factors include maternal age and maternal and multiparity. And typically, this we see this mostly in the last um, three weeks of pregnancy, or last trimester, and, and about three weeks after delivery. Um, and again, a diagnosis is made in differentiation from other forms, uh, etiologies for myocardial infection by coronary angiography. And treatment can be um, blood pressure management, antiplatelets, and also placement of stents. Uh, again, we talked about thrombolytic therapy not being a case, uh, not being optimal in this situation uh, due to fear for propagation of this. And what you see here in this um, is that you, the, the etiology here is this, there's a small intimal a tear in the intima in the blood vessel, and which then leads to oops, um, leads to um, a clot forming behind it. And as that clot gets bigger and pushes this intima off, you can actually have obstruction of the lumen, and it can be partial or complete. Uh, and that, uh, again, leads to the ischemia. So again, in pregnancy, uh, coronary artery dissection, the leading cause of uh, myocardial infarction. Now, switching gears to aortic um, dissection in pregnancy. Uh, which we'll have another talk on, but this is uh, more of a rare, uh, but very potentially catastrophic to both mom and, and fetus if it's not recognized. Um, the incidence is, uh, has, you know, published reports say around five per million, per five to six per million pregnancies, but the incidence is probably uh, increasing uh, and more significant uh, just based on the risk factors in the maternal population. Um, in fact, half of aortic dissections in women who are under the age of 40 occur in related to pregnancy. Um, and again, we talk about physiologic changes in pregnancy uh, that, that account for this. And um, the increased cardiac output uh, increases the stress on the aortic wall. And then uh, the effect of estrogen and, and placental hormone, other pregnancy related hormones that weakens the structural in integrity of the wall, like. What we see with SCAD, um, it's the same concept um, that the um, wall is a little bit weaker. And so with higher strain, um, that predisposes to, to the dissection. And most commonly, we see this again in the third trimester or, uh, or in the postpartum period. Risk factors, um, probably the, the single greatest risk factor and that we see most commonly are connective tissue disorders, specifically Marfan syndrome, uh, which accounts for a significant portion of these cases. Um, aortic valve abnormalities with bicuspid aortic valves uh, can also be associated with uh, aneurysmal development in the aorta. Um, coarctation of the aorta um, can also be associated with this, also often with a bicuspid aortic valve. Uh, and then uh, other patients who just have an increased aortic um, root diameter um, for, for reasons unknown. Sometimes uh, they've gone through a, a genetic evaluation and, and we're not sure why. Um, interestingly, hypertension, which is uh, very, very highly associated with aortic dissection in the non-pregnant population, there's a significantly lower incidence of this in the, in the, in the, in the pregnant. Uh, in the pregnant patient with dissection. Symptoms and diagnosis, um, again, very similar, uh, although uh, can sometimes be delayed due to uh, some overlap with what you see in pregnancy, but usually the, the severe onset of chest pain and radiation to, with radiation to the back should prompt a, a thought, especially if there are uh, risk factors. Uh, the di diagnosis is typically made with echocardiography and a transesophageal approach is optimal in pregnancy. Um, 
the results are, are comparable to CT angiography, but um, it um, doesn't um, re require radiation. It doesn't expose the feature, uh, fetus to radiation, so it's preferable. Um, and, and again, comparable in terms of the results. Uh, the management, and I, I think there will be a talk a little bit more about this in more detail, but just to touch on it, um, you know, the, the key in what we do is the um, gestational age at the time that this occurs. Now, fortunately, most of these occur uh, later in pregnancy in the third trimester when the fetus is viable um, at, or in the postpartum period. So there are, in the postpartum period, obviously, we don't have fetal concerns. So uh, for most of these patients, um, we do prompt uh, cesarean delivery um, in the, uh, in, usually here at Cleveland Clinic in these cases, uh, we'll do them in the cardiac surgery uh, operating room. So for me as an obstetrician, it's sort of like an actor performing on Broadway. It's a big, a lot more lights and TV monitors than what we're used to. But um, uh, we do do that, and then that's followed by aortic repair uh, after that. Now, it gets a little trickier in the periviable period, but fortunately, this isn't a frequent situation where fetus is potentially capable of survival, or if they survive, they have poor outcomes. Uh, and then what do you do then? Do you deliver the baby, or do you try to fix the repair, uh, or you try to repair the aorta um, with leaving the fetus in, inside? And that, that that's associated with poor survival with cardiopulmonary bypass and uh, in this setting. So. Um, that's fortunately something we don't deal with that much. Now, for a pre-viable gestational age, um, then I think it's usually then a repair with uh, usually a, a pregnancy termination. I mean, the priority there, there really aren't fetal concerns, so we have to just look at the mom in, in that setting. So um, I just did want to talk a little bit about Marfan syndrome because that is a condition that we see more frequently. Um, and here at the Cleveland Clinic, we do have an active program for management of uh, adults and children with uh, Marfan syndrome. Um, the uh, prevalence uh, roughly in the United States is about one in 5,000. Uh, and 80 percent of these patients have some degree of cardiovascular involvement, not necessarily all with aneurysmal development, but they do have some involvement. Um, and the key to these patients, again, and often um, there's this period where they get lost to follow up, um, and I see this a lot with kids from the transition from a childhood to adulthood. Sometimes they're lost to follow up, and we don't have uh, they don't have regular follow up. They don't have regular imaging of their uh, of their heart and aorta, uh, and then we see them sort of uh, only when they get pregnant. Um, so I've seen that situation a number of times, but again. Uh, ideally, this is, these patients are best dealt with uh, with preconceptional counseling, uh, and again, it needs to be multidisciplinary. Uh, in a preconceptional stage, we're able to perform all diagnostic studies that are needed to evaluate the aorta. We can also initiate treatment with beta blockers. Uh, and then if there is significant aortic root dilation, that, that should be addressed prior to pregnancy. Um, and, and that, you know, prevention would, is better than um, trying to deal with this afterwards. Uh, and then as far as uh, we can also have a discussion about management and, and, and delivery considerations. Um, so just briefly, with management during pregnancy, the aortic route is followed um, at least, um, you know, we try to follow it at least once a month. Um, and now if the route is not enlarged, so less than, uh, 40 millimeters in diameter, we will tend to follow them monthly and even allow for a vaginal delivery. Um, the one caveat to this is if we do see a, an increase in the aortic root of more than five millimeters, regardless of the size during pregnancy, um, we will then act um, and probably not allow for a vaginal delivery and, and, and plan for a, a cesarean delivery. If the root is increased, we'll follow closely. Uh, and usually do a cesarean section. Um, so, so that's the end. Thank you for your attention.